Welcome, marketing chefs. I've got something truly special cooking in our Omni Channel oven today. First, Marketing Kitchen TV Q&A. Up next in the Marketing Kitchen. Welcome to the kitchen, the Marketing Kitchen. Hi, I'm Ron Vining, your host of Marketing Kitchen TV. Okay, welcome back. This is the second installment of this new type of Marketing Kitchen uh, TV Q&A. So by asking me a question on the Twitter feed, which uh, is this one right here, Marketing Kitchen TV, it's at Marketing Kitchen TV utilizing the hashtag Q&A. If you ask a question there, I'll answer it here on YouTube. Uh, I have in in instituted, or trying to anyway, a new format so that I can get these out more quickly and less painfully. For any of you that haven't been uh, involved as a content producer on YouTube, then I'd like to share with you just how difficult it can be and how time consuming it can be. And for basically every 15 minutes of video, if you're going to do any form of editing, it could be an hour. So that would be film for 15, but you don't just film. You obviously you set it up, you get it ready. So you film for 15 and then you do an hour of edit and then you post it to YouTube, you create the thumbnail, you do some promotion to make sure, I mean, you took the time to record it, right? So might as well take some time to promote it. You're looking at a 15 minute video taking you maybe five hours. That's a lot. So to try to speed this up, this is the new format. This is the second video in this format. And I'm thinking maybe I should turn on another set of lights just so that it's a bit brighter because I didn't do that in the first episode. I thought it looked okay. But the camera on the MacBook, I'm amazed. I spent over $2,000 for the MacBook Pro. It's the ridiculous touch bar Mac that has had a thousand issues with it. And I'll be filming a video on that in the near future talking about the miserable, then quick turnaround experience that I had with Apple related to my MacBook Pro. But my iPhone, and this is the iPhone uh, 10s Max, and it has a better FaceTime camera than my MacBook does. Why? Why? Why does the new iPad have a better FaceTime camera than the MacBook does? I don't know. All right, let me hit the lights, and then I'm going to continue. The last uh, question that I took was from Jennifer, and thank you for those two questions. The next question that I'm going to take, <clears throat> if my voice holds out, and no, I don't have COVID-19, uh, the next uh, video, uh, sorry, the next question that I'm going to answer uh, is from Julia. And Julia, this is the type of issue that I also talked to Dave about, where the tweet has to be complete and if you, this is only for my students, if you are asking me a question on Marketing Kitchen TV, Q&A, Twitter, and you're not one of my students, then I'm not gonna give you a heck uh, about something being properly crafted. But <clears throat> you need to properly craft the entire thing and then delete the one that I asked that I said wasn't, okay? All right, anyway, let me hit the lights. Okay, let's take a look at Julia's question. And again, um, make sure that you get the full piece. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, the question is, uh, target marketing can maximize a marketing budget, but how can one make sure to put out the content that is necessary for consumers to see in order to sell more? Target marketing can maximize a marketing budget 
but how can one make sure to put out the content that is necessary for consumers to see in order to sell more? Okay. Uh, for those of you that didn't watch the first episode, I'm implementing a new egg virtual egg timer and I'm going to try to answer questions in two minutes. So far, you've seen that I've run over on every question and uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, to try to uh, be better in this particular video in keeping with the two minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to make it three minutes. Uh, okay. Okay, so how can one make sure to put out content that is necessary for consumers to see in order to sell more? Okay, again, it goes back to, it goes back to enterprise, product or service, channel, and your audience. Now, what is the channel that your audience is on? What channel is appropriate to market your product or service? And then what message will I, as the enterprise, put out talking about that product or service on that particular channel? How will I package that message in such a way that it appeals to you, the member of my audience? That's your dilemma. That's the, that's the marketing, uh, that's the whole marketing piece. What is the value proposition that I'm going to put together to enable or facilitate that process where I've created a journey for that particular customer so that it that's appealing to them so that they will then after seeing the content on that particular channel be interested in buying the product or service and then maybe clicking through to your website so that the transaction can occur I mentioned before in the first video because so the the companion to this so this is episode two if you will that you want to make sure that you are that you have a call to action that you have a close anytime you're in sales and this is included in this this type of marketing whether so it's a, whether it's organic or paid what you want to do is you want to make sure that you have a clear call to action you've you've put all the information that you need on in your message organic or paid but that you provide the method for the person to order, buy, or have that product fulfilled. Whether you're directing them to go to your physical location or whether you're having them go to the virtual location. I hope that answered your question, Julia. If it doesn't, by anyway, by everyone, if I don't answer your question and you want to know more, then ask me in the comments section and I will respond to you there. Or if necessary, I will film an additional video. I might even film a specific video for you to answer the question that you asked me here in the comments. All right, uh, stop that. Bing. Okay, uh, next question up here is Nick. Do you think uh, Google's current ranking system is working effectively, or do you think it still has major issues it needs to solve? That is an interesting one. All right, Nick, thank you very much for that question. Far be it for me, a former Google consultant, to answer that uh, particular question. Uh, yes, Google used to be, uh, I've, I've worked for Google on a couple of projects with different project managers, uh, with different deliverables, different aspects altogether. Um, let's see. I think that, uh, well, number one, we don't know Google's algorithm, right? And, and nor should we, uh, that's proprietary. They don't want you seeing that. They're in business to make money and the way that everything is set up is to help to facilitate that process. Um, I think that their rankings suit people that spend money or time on their platform. And there's nothing wrong with that either too. Let me go to, as a quick answer to this, uh, give an example. So I mentioned in the companion video to this, the episode one, that uh, when we're talking about technical SEO, how I purchased, I have two domain names. I've got um, Appflix TV and I have Appflix. I also have a lot more, uh, but let's just use those two for example. The canonical 
uh, for the website, for better or for worse, is Appflix TV. However, on everything social, I'm using Appflix, and I use that domain name, and it forwards to that canonical site as well. So technically, that should be harming my site. But guess what? It's not because on YouTube, I have filmed several videos that have not received a lot of views, but uh, they were in my reviews of The Mandalorian, which is on Disney+. Plus. In those videos, I have hashtagged Appflix. I have also mentioned it, and it's in the description. Well, because of that, Nick, guess what? If you do a search right now for Appflix, it comes up, it, it's there. And why? Google favors their platform. And it's also seen as third-party endorsement content because it's YouTube Marketing Kitchen TV talking about the website appflix.com. It works. There are simple organic ways of getting your content noticed and that's one of them. I used to do that a lot with Google Plus and unfortunately Google Plus is gone. And what a shame because when I was doing uh, my public speaking and my public training, uh, so my corporate speaking and my corporate training, uh, so anyway, that's what I meant to say, uh, that, uh, well, some of the engagements were private, some of them were public. But anyway, every time I would do an engagement, be invited to speak somewhere, or I was paid to speak somewhere, or I would be somewhere, I would talk about it on Google+. Plus. If you did a Google search, for example, uh, storytelling Singapore, what would happen in Google search rankings? I would be number one. I would beat out all of my competitors who were even paying for keywords. Why? Because I was doing posts on Google Plus talking about that I was the storytelling expert speaking at a specific event on a date and time, etc. And because of that, I hit high on the rankings. Google Plus is gone. I now do the same thing on YouTube and it works. There are YouTube stories uh, as well and I, I encourage people to use those because that's an opportunity to uh, basically uh, write something on the wall and have that work in a similar way that Google Plus had worked before. All right, I hope that answered your question, Nick. Uh, let's see, next question. Mr. Wang, or Mr. Wong, uh, let's see. Uh, bum, bum, bum. Shouldn't, uh, should let there be silence. I'm not used to recording live. Uh, I should know better. Being on stage is so different than being in my kitchen though. And you're like, I don't care. Will he just answer the question? And yeah, let me answer the question. Okay, oh, I was supposed to read the question first. All right, but anyway, great discussion on audience development and audience. To make the distinction between them can be essential towards marketing. More information on TikTok's growing user counts. So your question is, what? <laughs> what is the question? I need everyone to ask a clear and specific question for me to answer. Otherwise, this is just a talk about, and you don't want me to get on a talk about, because what will I do? I'll just talk. Maybe I should get on TikTok. And what are like, I, I'm amazed. One of my friends uh, sent me uh, an SMS the other day saying that his daughter spins, so now cooped up at home, right, because of COVID-19, watches TikTok videos all day long. And if they didn't take her phone away from her and make her engage with people, that's all she would do. What? Like... No wonder why we're, we have a generation of people who are going to be incapable to do anything other than produce ridiculous content. And I am totally amazed. I'm on a rant right now. I am totally amazed that a video that I'm recording here, which is providing, granted it's not the best, nowhere close, but I'm giving free marketing knowledge and insights that can improve your social, can improve your business, can improve your bottom line, increase your sales, blah, blah, blah. 
and I'll be lucky if this gets 70, maybe, maybe 125 views. Some nonsense, ridiculous TikTok video that then people are now resharing on Instagram of this nonsense gets 60,000 views? Ah! Why am I even on social media anymore? Maybe I'm too old to be on social media. Ugh. All right, so since there wasn't a real question here, I'm not exactly sure what you'd like me to answer. So if you want to ask a better, more structured question in a future post, I'll answer it. Or you can ask me in the comments and I'll follow up. But that's how I feel about TikTok. Demos asks, what techniques can companies utilize when pandemics like coronavirus are prevalent to ensure that not all ground is lost on social media campaigning? So I think what you're asking, Demos, is in the fact that um, COVID-19 is consuming all media, including social, that um, your own campaigning uh, on social will not be lost in the shuffle of all of that? All right, okay, I'll try, interesting. Let me try to answer that one for you. Okay, the counter is on. Um, first of all, you want to think about now yeah this is i this is the best of times and the worst of times in several areas number one is your product and service relevant in the fact that the economy has come to a halt in other words the government right or wrong and i say wrong and i'll do a, a non uh, marketing q a video about that but I, I can't resist right now. Uh, stopping the timer. I did a tweet on my at Ronald Vining feed where I respond to the Wall Street Journal article talking about is our lockdowns, our shutting down the economy the right thing to do? And I totally agree with the Wall Street Journal. Very rare that I do, but I totally agree in this instance. And you've heard the expression before about putting the cart before the horse, right? As opposed to putting the carrot out, enticing the horse to move forward to bring the cart with them. I continued on with that analogy. And in my tweet, I said that by a complete lockdown, we are, forget about putting the cart before the horse, we're dismantling the cart and we're slaying the horse. I think that this is the total wrong move. What good is it if the American economy goes into a severe depression or the global economy goes into a severe depression because we wanted to minimize the amount of people that caught the virus? So going to a purely marketing, let's talk about it from a purely mar marketing standpoint here. If there are no consumers then that and there are no jobs we have no economy therefore what good is it to market what is it that we can sell and should we sell do we run a risk of offending or alienating because we might be being insensitive like i'm afraid not afraid because I, really, I don't care about i really don't care about much of anything i've seen my uh, all of my investments, like everybody else, go down, right? My, forget, if I were banking on speaking publicly or consulting or training, it's gone. Like, who cares, right? So I'm just going to be honest with you. I think that we are dismantling the cart and slaying the horse and for those that remain and survive we got some hard road ahead as opposed to a more balanced approach like the country of singapore that i live in is taking 
where they're doing all of the same warnings, they're quarantining, they're taking measures, they're doing temperature checks, they're uh, doing everything to minimize exposure, they're full enforcing social distancing in supermarkets and movie theaters and things of that nature, but they're keeping the economy moving so that people can continue marketing, people can continue working, people can continue buying, so that when we come out of this, there are jobs there are companies that are still in existence so that we can live. Because what good is living through this if we're living through Great Depression number two? My, that's my opinion. All right, let me specifically answer your question. Okay, how can you get your message across when the media is being blanketed by something else? Well, I've certainly found that I get more impressions and views when, and likes and, and even feedback when I hashtag COVID-19 or coronavirus uh, on YouTube and in LinkedIn. Now, when you do this, you must make sure that you're just not randomly hashtagging that, but you're actually talking about it. So what I've been doing is I'm applying marketing theory or, polit or just politics, economic policy, and talking about it in relation to the virus. So that certainly is ensuring that my content is being seen. I'm also obviously hashtagging uh, uh, or keywords related to the economic, political, or marketing piece as well. That's one thing to do. Another thing to do is to, again appropriately, have it be more meme styled. So anything right now that's making fun of toilet paper shortages um, are getting a ton of play. So if you, and remember, always be careful when using humor or using sarcasm, because there's always going to be some rotten apple out there that is not going to appreciate or get the joke or the sarcasm. And remember, people, lives are being lost, right? Businesses are being destroyed. So you've got to walk, step lightly, and you don't want your brand to be embroiled up in, in, uh, in something that could re to be, be harmful to it. But like Tito's Vodka, for example, and the whole thing that, uh, where they came out and they said that, uh, they sent out the tweet, saying that their vodka is not a cure for coronavirus. Well, that's brilliant marketing, and I would guess that someone that works for them started that, that wasn't something organic. So I believe that at the ground zero of that was supposedly somebody sent out a tweet saying, asking Tito Vodka there, are you, you know, is this a cure for and then the company came out and said, no, we're not, but you know, we advise you know, drinking, blah, 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 whatever. I haven't followed it entirely. I would say that that was seeded content. So for example, that was either an employee or a friend of an employee or the ad agency that works for them, somebody on the staff that that came from. I'm guessing it was not a customer, just sort of like the, the uh, blue dress, uh, gray dress, or the shoes, or any of these things that have blown up and gone viral. They've actually originated in organically. Uh, and then there was also some paid promotion behind it. Any, and hate to be Machiavellian, but that's actually what brands do. So anyway, I'm taking up longer to answer your question, uh, Demos, but you could certainly do something uh, similar, I guess, to that Tito example, some type of a meme with a roll of toilet paper, um, there's some fun things that you can do that um, just make sure that they are tested with an audience so that uh, like a age range and sensitivity level um, like you know if someone's a snowflake or whether they're solid steel and uh, and and so you just don't want to be embroiled in something that could, you know, some blowback that could really harm your brand as opposed to help it. Uh, anyway, something to, uh, to keep in mind with that. 
Uh, also, um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't want to lose ground. I don't know that paid advertising is the right thing to be doing. I would say that you just do an, a good organic content program where you are posting relevant a brand, high level brand value, value added content. Perhaps maybe, so again, depending upon what your business is, uh, top 10 things to do at home with your kids, uh, top TV series to watch, uh, uh, the, the, best board, the, the best board games that you might have to keep you from being bored at home. If you were to do those types of lists and just simply have your company's logo on them or here's things that we recommend our employees to do while they're stuck at home, uh, things like that you can do. So that cuts through. Some of those things could organically, unlikely, but possibly go viral, if you will. And again, a uh, tongue in cheek there on the viral term. But uh, anyway, hope that answers your question there. Okay, Elizabeth, let's see. Um, you ask, uh, researching, uh, keyword researching is very helpful for SEO and SEM strategies. What are the best ways to conduct this research? Okay, well, Google uh, has a number of uh, keyword planning tools and uh, Alexa has a number. There are, so just go to Google. This is what I always do. I, I could do this in real time, but I don't wanna mess up my whole setup. It's there. <clears throat> Step two is, um, so in episode three, I'll do some practicing offline and get up and what I'll do is I'll have another window that's here and I can click on, I'll click on the source perhaps and we'll look at the source and then we'll actually do a Google and we'll take a look. But I'd recommend going to Google and I would type in and uh, looking at uh, like keyword planner would be a word, obviously then the Google one will come up. Uh, best ways to, um, uh, to search for keywords. I use Google Trends and I will enter in two different words and to see which word is trending and where and why and I break down and I look at the analytics on that. Uh, I am a gut instinct marketer, so I like data, but I don't get too buried in it. So what I do is I, I value data, but I use my gut instinct with my experience I've been doing marketing my entire life. Uh, so even before I had a career, I had a sales job. So back in high school, uh, I was doing sales. Um, I was doing marketing. Uh, I was a in marketing intern uh, right uh, <clears throat> while before I graduated high school. My first job was in marketing. I was an assistant marketing director right out of uh, while I was still in college. So uh, yeah, anyway, I, I think I know marketing inside and out. And uh, so I utilize, not, I'm not patting myself on the back, I'm just saying for me, I, I will look at a small amount of data. I look at what I, just exactly what I need. And so I would just go to Google, I would look at a couple of different uh, uh, tools. Um, again, looking at keyword trends, using a keyword planner, looking at a third or maybe fourth party, so getting outside of Google. And then I would also be looking at my own internal metrics. I, I hope that you're measuring the effectiveness of, um, of campaigns to see whether or not, uh, and looking at so sort of A-B testing, words that you've used in the past or images that you've used or channels, et cetera. I'm talking with my hands too much. Uh, that all of that would go into play for helping me decide what is the best words to use for me. Uh, I hope that answers your question. And then my final question that I'm going to answer for this second video, and then we'll take some more in episode three in this companion series. And uh, I'm going to do them all until I answer all of these questions. Uh, so we'll see, but anyway, uh, we'll see how that goes, how many videos we put out. All right, next question here. The idea for paid content marketing had greater benefits than I agree. Hmm. All right, let me read Joe's comment first. 
In today's marketing world, there are many options in terms of content marketing, but one of the most effective and strategic methods is that of paid content marketing. All right, the idea of paid content marketing had greater benefits than I agree, but using the same content could sabotage as it seems boring when same content appears again and again. Isn't the same attraction leading to downfall? Isn't the same attraction Okay, I think I get what you're asking. Future questions though, please, please um, write out the question and ask yourself if that's something that you could answer. Uh, and then that helps me in being able to answer it as well. All right, let's take that. Okay, what is some of the best advertising on TV and radio? that is repetitive content so you're hearing a tagline you're hearing a jingle that's the song you're hearing a catchphrase over and over and over again so that is an important aspect since the dawn of radio uh, even and you know in a newspaper ad radio television same thing is true on social media now you don't want to have the same content appear over and over and over again. However, what's wrong with a rerun? So when you turn on TV, you see new original content. So let's say it's a TV series. You see a new episode, but then also maybe on a different network or the same network, you see a repeat or a rerun. Now, if the content was good, are you angry or offended or turned off by that rerun, that repeat? I think the answer is no, because you know what happens on social media? Social media is 24 seven, three, six, five. And so for example, on my LinkedIn, I uh, and my team, because it's not just me, uh, we post, we used to post 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I did get some blowback. Now the content it was, was unique because we've created enough content for there to be no repeats for six months. And we're continually adding new content. So, and next time I talk about this, we might have enough content to be able to go 24, seven, three, six, five, four, seven months, right? But I did get feedback that my, their LinkedIn, or their Twitter was monopolized by nothing but Ron Vining. Or if they had set their setting on LinkedIn to receive an email notification, then 90% of the posts were from Ron Vining. And that's too much. So now we post 12 hours a day on a rotating schedule on uh, the, the hours that a post rotates on different days, different times each day of unique content. Now again, that content will repeat sometime in the next 12 months, because now that we've gone from 12, hour, 12 posts a day, from 24 posts a day to 12 posts a day, we can extend that window out to 12 months. Is it wrong for you to see a post from me in January of 2019, and then see that post again in January of 2020? Or is it even wrong if you saw that post in January of 2020, and then you see that post again in March of 2020? I don't think so. Because the likelihood of the person seeing that post twice is quite rare, unless they're like stalking me. And I don't know any why anyone would wanna do that. So why is it rare? Because on social media, there are people, thousands of people, thousands of companies, brands and from entertainment to hospitality to F&B to B2B and whatever that might be uh, posting 24 7 365 with all of that content that is there if you are not posting continuously then no one's going to see any of your content so don't be afraid of having repeats or reruns because there's a good chance that your audience will, will have not seen it the first time, second, third, or fourth time. So by hitting them with the fifth, they will. 
Now, I totally oppose if you were to, let's say you take your Twitter feed, and let's say that you are posting the same content every hour for 24 hours, absolutely not. But if you are posting value-added content 24 hours a day, so there's, let's say, so there's 24 tweets that you send out, and each of those tweets are a different source, different piece of value-added content, that's completely fine to do because it's unique. That would be like turning on the TV, because again, you're not gonna get angry if you turn on the TV and you see 24 different episodes that you could watch. But you would get angry if you turn on the TV, like let's say at Thanksgiving or Christmas time, when a Christmas story is playing 24 hours a day, uh, right? And you've got no other content that you can watch. So I think that's the balance of repeating content versus having new content. There needs to be, and that's why I created the company called Brand Influx, because brands need to have an influx of new content continuously. So what my formula anyway for my own company, as well as for any client that I advise, is we create original content that is seeded throughout the day, understanding of course when audiences see things and we, we project out in the window and we put in old content with new, old content with new, and that process goes on. And uh, I don't know, I, that's my approach anyway. I hope that answered your question. All right, we will continue. We'll uh, continue where we left off in the next video, but that's all I have for you in this one. So this is episode two. I look forward to seeing you in episode three and the next uh, Marketing Kitchen TV Q&A. Thanks a lot for your questions. I, I, I appreciate them. I hope, especially at the time uh, that I'm filming them and you're watching them, it's another thing to break up the boredom of, uh, that's out there. All right. See ya. Keep safe. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, there's always fresh content simmering on our storytelling stovetop. So whatever happens in this kitchen shouldn't stay in this marketing kitchen. I'm Ron Vining, your host, reminding you to invite your family and friends to the next episode of Marketing Kitchen TV.